Welcome to video three in a series of introductory videos for the InventorCam CNC programming software. This video topic is creating a new milling project. So um, being a add-on to Inventor, we actually uh, work within the same Inventor interface, meaning that we're basically just gonna go up to here, Inventor Cam, and we'll go to new. So um, basically we start with an Inventor part, like you see on the screen, and we'll just choose the module we'd like to enter into in the Inventor Cam add-on. Uh, you'll see here that there's a list of the modules available from Inventor Cam, um, and these are very basic. If you're doing milling, you'll choose milling. If you're doing turning, you can choose turning or mill turn. Uh, the only differences here are, um, in terms of turning and mill turn, is some of the functionality that I'll be covering in the later uh, videos in this series. Uh, but for today, we're doing a milled part, so I'm just going to choose milling. So as soon as I choose that module, it opens up the Inventor Cam add-on. This is just a splash page, just letting you know which version you're on, uh, just you know, marketing sort of thing. <clears throat> and then you get to the first window from Inventor Cam. And this is where you're gonna make some selections in terms of the type of file that you're creating. So um, we are integrated into Inventor, but we're actually going to create a separate external Inventor Cam file. That way we can add um, our own sketches to it, we can make modifications to a copy of the model, anything that would help the programmer or the machinist to better machine the part. Um, and it's still associative with the original inventor part. It's just now you have your own copy of the part that you can play with, maybe make some changes to make machinable that uh, only occur inside of your external part file. So we actually choose where we'd like to save that external part file. Uh, by default, this option right here, use model file directory, the box will be checked, meaning that my inventor cam file will be saved in the same directory as the original inventor part. Now, if I don't want to save that in the same directory, I'd like to choose where I save this file, I can uncheck that box and actually just browse to a folder that I would like to place this, um, this separate inventor cam file. Now, I'm browsing to a particular file, but you'll notice that as soon as I uncheck this, there is already an address in there. And that is the same address that we saw in video one in the global settings, the user directories, where we'd like to save our CAM parts. So to see uh, which is uh, your default address, uh, check out your global settings and you'll see how to do that in video one of this series. So because we're setting up a separate file, we also need to give it a name. Now by default, it takes the name of the original inventor part. So you'll see here that I've called this gatebox intro video. The inventor CAM file will also have the same name, gatebox intro video. Uh, this right here is the address of the original inventor part. So like I mentioned earlier, we are associative with that inventor part. So this is the address that your inventor cam file will use to look and keep up to date with the original inventor part. <clears throat> and then lastly, right here is the units of measure we're going to use in this particular inventor cam file. This doesn't have to be the same units of measure that you see in the original inventor part. Uh, inventor cam allows you to just use whatever units of measure you want. You can switch from metric to inch here. This is your opportunity to set this for the inventor part. So again, referencing video one, your global settings would have set these up as a default. I set it up as inch originally in video one, and here I'm opening up a new part, and the inch is automatically selected. But here, if I were working with a metric part, would be my opportunity to switch it to metric. So I'll leave this as is, and I'll just click OK. So it closes the original inventor file and opens up my inventor cam file, which has a copy of that solid in there. Okay, so we can see that we have an inventor part on screen. This is actually my copy of it. And Inventor Cam calls this the design model. So I can make changes to this if I want. I can add solids to this. I can add sketches to this. Whatever would help me to better uh, get my programming, my operations created. On the left side here is the definition of the Inventor Cam part. So we begin with the post processor file. You'll see that this uh, the software comes with some default posts uh, with the software. Um, they're generic posts. You'll see you've got some Haas, some Herco on there. Um, this is just the default list. It's just a generic list. It should help you in terms of training. It should help you to get running with your, with your operations, but they might not be specific to your machine. You might uh, need some changes to the code, uh, and that is the kind of request you would send to our post-processor department. Give them the make and model of your machine, and they can tailor-make a post-processor for you, for your machine, 
that best fits the kind of operations you want to do, the kind of cycles you'd like to see inside your code. For the purpose of the video, I'm just going to go with the Haas SS. Okay, so now that I've chosen my post, I can go and define my part. So the first thing I'm going to do is set up a coordinate system. So the coordinate system is how we're going to tell Inventor Cam where this part is sitting in space, basically. And then on your machine, this will be your first offset. So it currently says Mac 1 position 1. Mac 1 relates to the first offset on your machine. So whether that's G54, that's 154P1, 54P1, uh, whatever your machine accepts as the first offset, Mac 1 translates to that through the post processor. Position 1 is essentially just 0 degrees. If you're doing multi-axis work, you'll have positions 2, 3, 4 for all the different angles you'll have to put this part on, on an index table, um, trunnions, whatever you have. Um, if you only do 2.5D work, meaning you're just doing pocketing, profiling, drilling on just X, Y, and Z, then you will keep it in position 1. But if you do multi-axis stuff with ABC angles, you'll most likely end up using positions two, three, four, and those relate to any offset that you create. So how that really relates here is Mac 1 position 1 is my G54. Mac 1 position 2, if I had this part at a completely different angle, then what we would get is just Mac 1 position 2 on that angle. So let me just back up and come back in here. So we're setting up our Mac 1 position 1, and we have five options here on how to set up that coordinate system. These five options really just relate to the type of geometries you have on the screen. So customers may have just simple 2D geometry, a DXF file, DWG file, whatnot, anything that is just lines and arcs, or maybe even just points. You'll have options of using the 3D points associative and the define options. And all these really do is allow you to choose a point for your origin, a point for the x-axis positive direction, and a point for the y-axis positive direction. As soon as I set up my x and y, I have my z by the right-hand rule. And that z is pointing in that direction there. So that is useful when you only have points or maybe even lined arcs, those, that sort of thing, geometry. The define option works in a similar way. It just takes a little further, and instead of choosing points, I can choose lines. So in this case, there's my x-direction, there's my Y direction, and again, there's my Z by the right-hand rule. Um, again, define and three points associative, those are for when you don't have a lot of geometry on the screen, you don't have a solid, you don't have surfaces. Normal to current view, essentially, like I said, for five-axis users, if I want to angle this a certain way and say that is a good angle for my tool to come in, let's say I'm doing some sort of coolant hole down a very long part on a five axis, and I don't know what angle I want it at, I just know that what I'm looking at right now is a good angle. Well, I can click on Capture Current View, and it'll actually place the Z axis coming out of the screen, the X positive axis going to the right, and the Y positive axis going to the top of the screen. And that is simply just for five axis work. It's a very simple way to do it, and it's a very useful way when you're just kind of looking for clearance areas and that sort of thing. Uh, and then the select coordinate system, you'll see here that there's a bunch of coordinate systems that came from the inventor part. We can use those here as inventor cam coordinate systems. And again, all it is is just I click on one of these, and it sets up the coordinate system relative to the inventor coordinate system. But the more, most common one that's used is select face. Now, this is for when you have flat surfaces or solids with faces that are flat, and, and you can place your z-axis perpendicular to those faces. So I should mention that wherever you're doing these coordinate systems, always remember that the z-axis is your tool axis. So for instance, if I would like to be able to do tool paths on the top of this part, I want to make sure I choose any one of these top faces so that my z-axis points perpendicular up from those surfaces, meaning that my tool will come from that direction. Under select face, I have these options here of place coordinate system origin. Many options here, again, all they relate to is the type of geometry you want to use to define your coordinate system. In this case, the origin of the coordinate system. I'm going to use the top corner of model box, which will place the origin at the top corner of, um, we call the model box. It's essentially just all the flat faces, all the points that just meet up in imaginary space. And you'll see that as soon as I click on the part. So I'm actually going to choose it from the final part, let me just do a select other, and I will find my face there. So we get a representation of the model box. 
So you see that these lines right here are flush on those edges there, and this is the imaginary corner made by those edges. That is the top corner of this model box. Now, as soon as I place the origin on the screen, it's not actually stuck there. I have the option of moving that around. All I've done so far is told InventorCam I want my z-axis to be perpendicular to the top face of the part. I can come over here to the left side and use my modify pick, modify flip to move this coordinate system around. So let's say I want to put it in this corner over here. I'll pick on pick origin, choose that point right there, which is the opposite corner of the model box. Let me just do a select other right there. We'll pick that point. And now you'll see that it just literally just translated it over there. The X and the Y are in the wrong direction. So I can use my flip around Z to get my X and the Y in the correct direction. Now that is the model box generated off of the target solid, the final solid. Um, but you'll see that I have an additional solid here that represents the stock. Um, I actually want to put my core system on that because that's more realistic for when I put it on the machine. So I can go back to select face. This time choose the top face of the stock. Let me jump out of here and jump back in so I can refresh that. We'll do select face, top face of the stock, and you now see that the coordinate system is in the top corner of the stock. The model box still popped up. It just is on the outside edges of the stock, so they're kind of coincident there. Uh, but I still want to shift it to the other side. So I'll do the same thing I did before, move it over there, flip around. And now I have a coordinate system on the top edge of the stock. This will be my G54 or my first offset on my CNC machine. Click the green check mark, check my levels here. So you'll see that again, from the global settings you saw in video one, I have one inch clearance level, five inch tool start level, and 10 inch tool Z level. Those are default parameters generated by the fact that I chose as my upper level, the top edge of the stock. So Z zero is the top edge of the stock. And then each one of these levels is taken from there. Okay, I'll click on the green check mark on that. There's my Mac one position one. And I've created my first coordinate system. Now, if I want to do the back side, I actually didn't even have to leave this screen. I could have stayed on the screen and said, add, and we'll add a coordinate system for the opposite side, the bottom side of the part. Okay, so like I said, the Mac number corresponds to the offset. So in this case, I want to do it for the second offset, my G55. So we have Mac 2 position 1. Again, I'll click on Select Face, top corner model box, and just choose the bottom face of the stock. And if you remember, the Z axis is our tool axis, meaning that as soon as I set up my Mac 2 position 1, I can now have toolpass.com from the back side of the part, meaning that I've taken this piece out of a vise, flipped it around, put it back in the vise, touched off on this top corner, and now I have my second offset. I can do operations on the second side. Click the green check mark to accept that. Once again, check my levels. And once again, in this new coordinate system, I have a new Z0 on the top face of this part here, and my clearance levels taken from that Z0. So now we have our coordinate systems. Next, we'll go to stock. The stock will be the raw material that we're going to make this part out of. That could be uh, a cast, casting, a forging. Uh, it could be literally anything that you are going to put on your machine to machine to get what this final part looks like. And we can tell InventorCam what that is using these five options here. So if you had a casting that you laser scanned or, you know, you ferro arm point cloud generated, uh, you can use the STL format selection. STL is a point cloud format. And again, it's just really useful for this particular aspect here where you can just bring in oddball solids to represent your stock. If you don't have an STL format, but you do have a model of another oddball stock, maybe some casting forgings, a pre-machined part, anything like that, you can use the 3D model option. So any format that can be read by Inventor, you can import into this, this screen right now and then assign it as your stock using the 3D model option. Cylinder is useful when you're doing turning. You can actually define a basic cylinder, the OD, the ID, and length of the, of the cylinder or the bar stock centered around the Z axis. So it's really useful for turning, not so useful for milling because unless I have my Z axis dead center of my part, I'm not gonna have a, a proper representation of the bar stock. In this case, if I were to choose that right now and then choose my solid, it's basically gonna place the center of that cylinder around the Z axis 
and then have an oversized stock. So that's not what we would want to use. Extruded boundary, basically what you could do is you could take a edge off the solid, let's do a constant Z around there, and it creates an extruded stock. So again, very useful if you're machining extrusions and you want to just get a very basic, very quick definition of that extrusion. Box is similar to the cylinder definition where it creates a basic box around the part. So for instance, if I choose a surface from the final part, you'll see that it creates a box definition around that box. Now this looks similar to the model, the, uh, model box that we saw when we created the um, coordinate system. It works in the same principle. It's finding lines and edges that are flush with the outside edge of the part and creating a box definition there. So that would represent the minimum amount of material required to machine this, um, this final part. Now, I'm actually not going to use that, but let's just continue with this scenario. If I were to actually use that box definition, but I wanted to make sure I had material represented on the outside edges for machining, I'd come over here to expand box and I can place material. So let's say I just place an inch of material around all the outside. Now that's oversized, but I want to show you as I update that, the blue box actually expands to show the one inches all the way around the part. And again, very basic definition. It's just the kind of thing that you plug in just to get going with your operations. Now that was relative to the model. So I just put one inch on all the outsides of the part, but I can switch it to absolute. And you'll actually see now that it came in with some default settings. I'm actually gonna just um, change it to the exact sizes of the model using take model dimensions. Okay, so once again, it actually found the, the stock model that I had there. So it's all flush on all sides. But again, I still have control of these dimensions. I can add excess material. Let's say I wanna make this 10 inches in the positive X direction, maybe 10 inches in the positive Y direction. Again, you see the blue box expanding and now I'm using absolute coordinates from the coordinate system that I created. But since I have a 3D model to represent my stock, I'm just gonna switch this to 3D model and actually click on the solid. So that solid right there represents my 3D model. And we're also associated with that 3D model, which means that even if I program a very complex part, if I change the stock, I just have to update the stock model in Inventor, and then all my toolpaths, anything related to this stock geometry, this 3D model, will be updated as well. Okay, finally is target. Now target is very simple. All you're doing is you're just saying what solid on the screen currently represents the final part. So I just choose that right there. And that is the final part. So in my simulations, in my analyses, anything that I want InventorCamp to tell me, <clears throat> it now knows what the stock is, what the target is. It'll look for the differences between the two. Let me know if there's any material I need to remove. It let me know if I've gouged the part in any way. But at minimum, if you're just doing pocketing, profiling, drilling, very basic, basic toolpaths, you don't actually have to do the stock and the target. Just for the purpose of the video, I'm showing you all the basics for the creation of a milling part. If you have any further questions on this or anything else you see in these videos, you can always call us at 1-866-975-1115, extension 2. You can send us your parts or your questions via the ticket system at solidcamsupport.com or stay tuned for the rest of the videos on this YouTube channel or in the series of the InventorCam videos. Thanks for watching.